Hands up those who love a promise of God, promise from God. God gave me a promise, and I'll talk about it, but, you know, out of Psalm 23 where he uh, lay, uh, leads me beside quiet waters and lays me down in green pastures, he restores my soul. And, uh, and so I'm so looking forward to that. I'll talk about that in a moment. But, but to every man has been given a measure of faith. I can remember going and visiting my auntie. She was dying in hospital. This was many years ago. And she said to me, Peter, I wish I had your faith. And uh, I've had a number of people say that to me. And of course, my reply is, you have faith. You have a measure of faith. You have enough faith right now to get saved. A lot of people think they need a little more. They need to know more. They need to do more. No, I said, you have enough faith now to reach out to Christ. And she did and got saved on a deathbed, which is awesome, isn't it? And so to every man has been given a measure of faith. Obviously, we grow in faith, and I hope and pray I have grown in faith. hope I've grown in patience as well and, uh, and other good attitudes that have been tested over the past couple of weeks. But everybody say, I have faith. I have faith. As you know, Pastor Joe just finished an awesome series on discipleship. And I know everybody here was blessed by it, but discipleships, and please don't expect me to get out the paint and to get out the, you know, and then the, you know, do, do these uh, wonderful illustrations this morning. I don't even know whether I got a song for you. How disappointing is that? But, but in any case, but f- discipleship is all about following Jesus. And it's all about obviously walking in his footsteps, right? John chapter one, verse one says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. I love this. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. And in verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. You know, being disciples of Jesus, and I'm talking to you this morning, Really, we are disciples of the Word of God because the two are inseparable, amen? And so His Word, I'm going to look at the Word of God this morning, obviously. But in Hebrews chapter 11, known as a chapter of faith. Everybody say the chapter of faith. You know, I'm, I'm real big on heroes of faith and, and I talk about people who have done incredible things over the years, but coming right back into the Bible, there's this chapter 11 and it's well known as a hero of faith chapter. And it lists eight people out of the book of Genesis, eight people. That's an interesting number right there. Eight is talking about resurrection and so forth. Eight people that it says by faith. By faith, Abel. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Sarah. By faith, Isaac. By faith, Jacob. By faith, Joseph. All from the book of Genesis. And then it moves into the book of Exodus and it lists two more people before it goes on to uh, talking about a whole lot of others that that the writer didn't have time to name and it says people whom the world was not worthy of. But then it lists Moses and Rahab out of the book of Exodus. But in verse 6 it says, And without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is, what? A rewarder of those who do diligently seek Him. So without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now please hear me this morning. Faith is simply believing in God. Faith is simply believing. It's not complicated, we'll talk about it. But as we walk through life, as we journey through life, all on a journey, can I encourage you to believe? To believe, right? Would you say that with me? I believe. believe. Man, I could sing a Celine Dion song right now. Okay, I won't. Maybe a Billy Joe. He was just in town, right? Billy Joe? Joel, somebody. Guns and Roses are all in town. Peter Morlock's in town. Well, in any case, okay. In any case, I want to look at these great eight people from Adam in the book of Genesis to take us to where we are today. These eight principles are going to be short. I encourage you to write them down. You won't remember them. I know that. But number one, Abel. Everybody say Abel. Oh, here's a song. He's able, he's able, I know he. All right. They're cheering me on in Belcluza, I know that. <laughs> Hebrews 11 verse 4. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, to which he obtained witness, though he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And of course we can read about it in Genesis 4.2 where Abel, it says, brought the firstlings of his flock 
and the fat thereof. And Jehovah had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. Isn't it amazing? You know, when you give your best to God, it does something in the heart of God. But if you give God your leftovers, if you just come to God blasé as if you don't really care, you know, it's amazing the difference here. Abel brought a more excellent sacrifice to God. And to me, Abel demonstrates or illustrates, I should say, the simplicity of faith. Everybody say the simplicity of faith. Simplicity of faith. Too often we want to complicate it today. Too often we want formulas. We try to listen. I can recall, you know, in the days, you know, you'd listen to people. Um, I, I mean, I won't go back too far, but, well, I don't know who to, who to say now because somebody would take me wrong. But, you know, some great faith preachers in the world, particularly, obviously, out of America, but it's not an American gospel. It's a Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John gospel, right? But you listen to a faith preacher and you try to formulate it, right? And people try to copy the words, just in case there was a key there, right? And we often want to complicate it, but we want to work out a formula. But Jesus said, would you become like little children again and simply believe? And so Abel just demonstrates the simplicity of faith. Let's talk about Enoch. Enoch was a great hero of mine because he walked with God and was no more. That's what I plan on doing. I got a little bushwalk at home down by the still water. One day I'll have my coffee, go for a walk. People say, where is he? The Lord took him. I love it. Not today, Bev. It's okay. Got to unpack yet. Enoch. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. Wow. And it's found in Genesis 5, 24, where Enoch walked with God and was no more for God took him. Enoch was translated to heaven because of his, hallelujah, his godliness and his consistent walk. I have to confess, the day that the truck door slammed into my garage, I probably wouldn't have been taken that day. No, just kidding. <laughs> Enoch, because it's just on top of everything else, hands up those. It wasn't just one thing. I can handle one thing. It's when it's like a multiple of things, you know. No excuses, Peter. Like... <laughs> See, Enoch illustrates the stability of faith. The stability of faith. See, it's one thing to believe God in the good times. Anybody can believe God if you just won, I used to say the art union, but it's lotto today, right? Anybody can believe God. Like, I just see a young couple just got married from the, back from the honeymoon. Look at them back here. I saw them on Friday night. One was sitting at that end of the row, and the other one was sitting at that end of the row. There's a whole row of kids between them. It wasn't a good look. <laughs> not back from the honeymoon, it wasn't. But you know, I mean, if they're not rejoicing in the Lord on their honeymoon, something's wrong, right? It's easy to believe God in the good times. But as I said, when something happens to you, which, you know, happened to me just recently, and you might think that's a little thing, but there's other things that are going on in our lives which we won't go into. But the thing is, is that, do you believe in the harder times? Yeah. David said, seven times a day, I will praise you. Seven times a day, I will praise you. Day in, day out, week in, week out. You know, sometimes people only come to church, you know, for sunshine. Other people come to church when it's raining because they want to go to the beach when it's sunshine. Hello? When, you know, when Jesus went to the cross, he didn't look out the window and say, oh, the weather doesn't suit me today. I'll put it off till next week. And so day in, day out, week in, week out. And so do you have stability of faith? Noah, 11, Hebrews 11, 7. We're talking about this Hebrews chapter 11 chapter. Many of you know it's the heroes of faith. Are you with me down there in Invercargill? By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark, which, of course, New Testament is a church, for the saving of his household, you've got to be in the ark, right? There's a storm coming. Hands up those who know the storm's coming. The storm's brewing on the earth. Hello. I know many people don't read rots the news these days because it's too bad. I get it. But it's good to hear what's going on. And the storm's brewing all over the place. Prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness, which is according to his faith. And that story, by the way, of course, is found in the book of Genesis, chapter 6 to chapter 9. But Noah built an ark out of obedience to God. He preached for 120 years without a convert. Wow. 
I mean, we had a number of saved on Friday night. Pastor Joe gave a great older call message. But imagine 120 years, I'd be a little discouraged, right? But his whole family was saved from destruction. So what does Noah illustrate to us? Are you making notes? <laughs> Noah illustrate the significance of faith. Simplicity of faith, stability of faith, significance of faith. Are you getting the essence this morning? Man, you do all this work and then I'm going, yes, amen, glory. Significance of faith. See, faith will save you. Believing, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. How significant is it? It's ultra significant. You'll be saved. No, I was saved. Say, I have faith. Number four, Abraham. Abraham. Now, Abraham, I have to confess, because he's the father of all who believe in such an amazing character. There's three areas we could talk about. I'm just going to go to one, but let me give you the three very quickly. Three areas that he did, demonstrated amazing faith in. A, I've got to go A, because I'm going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So A, man, I'm a teacher. I need a blackboard. You still have those? Whiteboard. Who missed chalk fights? We used to have chalk fights at school. I know Grant did because he used to throw chalk at me at school. A, you'd get the cane back in those days for having chalk fights. Especially when the teacher walked in the door at the wrong time and he received a bit of chalk on the side of his head. He set out not knowing, this is Abraham, he set out not knowing where he was going. I'm going to talk about Mount Wellington in a moment because there's a whole reason that I spoke this at Mount Wellington last week because as many of you will know, we sold the building at Mount Wellington. There was a, uh, a number of reasons, but we just kept hitting a ceiling in the size of the auditorium. You know, the first year at Mount Wellington, the first year, and Pastor Maria, I'm looking for her, but she was counting the number of souls that we saved and it was 1,101. Uh, 1,111, yeah, 1111. I mean, the first year, you couldn't, you, couldn't have, you couldn't have done it if you tried, right? And uh, of the two years, we had 2,000 people saved at that campus. Many of you, some of you were there at that time. Incredible. That is revival, whether you like it or not. I mean, seriously, for New Zealand. And, uh, you know, the church has grown, it's very healthy, but the, the auditorium is just not conducive because it's so wide and so narrow. And there are other reasons, but the reasons are is that we've sold it and they're moving out, and we're going to be explaining that to you in a moment so you know about your brothers and sisters at Mount Wellington. Very important. And, uh, of course, we're looking for another building. Last year, buildings were very hard to find. There's a few more coming on the market now, but we've got the money to buy one. It's just finding the right one, right? We're in a good place, praise the Lord. Wonderful. And so, like even in my personal life, my personal life, my goal was to be debt-free at my age, 41. <laughs> and by the grace of God, I'm going to achieve that. And now the church is also debt-free, which is awesome. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And God spoke to me the other day, which is amazing. He said, you know that... Uh, And, you know, obviously I've taken huge steps in my life and I don't regret those. And, uh, you, know, you, you, you know, to get ahead and so forth, you, you borrow against a house and so forth, so forth. And, and we've done that our whole lives. But, you know, God spoke to me. You know, it's 430 years to the day, to the day when God released the children of Israel out of bondage from Egypt. Amazing. And I was saying to Bev, you know, we've been married, as you know, over 50 years, but about 43 years ago, we went into debt. And I was done, it's not 430, but 43. But, you know, God spoke to me. He's releasing me from the bondage of Egypt. So Abraham set out not knowing where he was going. I often say to people, some people, I... Uh, I know some of you have traveled to this country. That was a big step of faith. I get that. Other people need to get out more. I, I can recall when I was selling real estate in South Auckland, I had a lot of people that never had ever even been into the city, into Auckland City. I had to drive them into the solicitor. I mean, you know, it's amazing how some people get stuck in a rut. The only difference between a grave and a rut is a, a grave's got two ends. 
And, uh, you know, I'm a small town boy from Stratford. I know people are still living in Stratford. Now, nothing wrong with Stratford. But some people are still living in the same house, in the same street. You know what I mean? And, and uh, you know, maybe nothing wrong with that, but, you know, I just like a journey of faith. I like stepping out a little bit and taking some risks. They say the number one regret in a retirement village, and I'm not heading there today. <laughs> Probably my next move, right? But the thing is, is the number one regret is I wish I'd taken more risk. I wish I'd taken more risk. And I've taken a number of risks, and by the grace of God, it's paid off. I had a couple that things didn't. I remember, I remember, I'll just tell you this little story, real estate. Because I'm just taking my time this morning. Got a big afternoon. We bought 12 acres on Waiheke back in the 70s because they were giving property away in Waiheke in those days. You, they'd give away sections because to mow the section with the gorse and that, it wasn't worth it. So, so that, they'd donate them to the school and you could buy a section for a thousand bucks. True. We bought a couple. And, and, uh, but we bought 12 acres on the water there. On the water. 12 acres for $12,000. I signed up. It was a good deal, right? And Bev wanted a deep freeze. I had $500 deposit. So Muggs me went and bought the deep freeze. 12 acres we didn't get. Today there's a beautiful subdivision on it. I could have been a multi-millionaire, not just a millionaire. No, just kidding, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. In any case, praise the Lord, I just said that for any reporters here. Hallelujah. Um, <laughs> so, so sometimes, you, you, you know, you, you, you don't take the, the risk you should have taken, right? But in any case... I guess a deep freeze is at the rubbish tip somewhere. Um, but he set out not knowing where he was going. And so it's a journey. You know, it's a journey. I don't, I don't want to live a, a small life. Life is too short to be little, right? And so too often we want the familiar. You know, I know most people drive to work the same way and they drive home the same way. I can remember when I was working on the harbour board because I was a heathen, right? And uh, down in New Plymouth building that, that tower, you know, the, the chimney and so forth, so the driving cranes. And my car or my motorbike uh, would, would know the way to the pub every night. I mean, that was just what you did, right? Routine. People like the familiar. People like the routine. They like what is comfortable. They like what is convenient. Are you with me today? Yet God often calls us on because life is one big transition. And you know, I got a saying, behold the turtle. He only makes progress when he sticks his head out. You got to put your head out occasionally, right? 11, Hebrews 11 verse 8, by faith Abraham obeyed when he called to go out to a place where he would receive an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. Wow, by faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him of the same promise. For he waited for the city who has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Wow, is that what you're looking for? I know you've got to live somewhere on this earth and it's nice to live in a place, I get that. You know how the weather and, and comfortable and so forth. But Abraham understood he didn't have a permanent home here on the planet, but he had a permanent faith. I said he didn't have a permanent home, he had a permanent faith. He was a sojourner passing through. Too often people want to hold on to things. Don't want to let things go, as Pastor Joe spoke about. And B, that was A, by the way, B, I'm getting to C. He had faith to trust God in impossible situations in relation to bearing a son through Sarah. She, she was way past it. She was past menopause. She was 100 plus, you know, 90, 90, sorry. And he was 100 and so forth. And so they were way past their best. Don't look at me like that, Bev. <laughs> Any case, Romans speaks, Romans speaks about this in depth. Verse 19, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he is about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's room. See, I didn't make it up. He did not waver the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that he had promised he is also able to perform. That's a great, great thought right there. I got to talk about C. I better, uh, I better not say anything more about that. We've got visitors. He was willing, this is a point I want to get to about uh, the illustration of Abraham's faith. Abraham was willing to give back to God that which God gave him in the obedient act of offering his son Isaac to God on the altar. 
Now, this is an incredible story. Hebrews 11, 17. By faith, Abraham, when he is tested, offered up Isaac, who had received the promises. And the New Testament talks about he actually did it. But as you know, the story, God stopped him. And promises offered up in his begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed will be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he received him as a figure of sense. Now, I don't have time to get into how God gave his son. And this was a great illustration Everything in the old, uh, hallelujah, first in the natural, then in the spiritual, right? But too often we want to hang on to what God has given us and not willing to let it go and understand that we are only stewards of even of our children, not realizing that this isn't really ours, right? Abraham, here it is, the S, illustrated the sacrifice of faith. See, if you want to walk in faith, there'll be times where God calls you to sacrifice, You'll never journey in faith unless you're prepared to sacrifice. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed, you know, like, <laughs> you're right, Pastor Joe, so simple, give and you shall receive. I'm, I'm amazed how many Christians don't get that in relation to tithing and offering. You know, I've tithed since I became a Christian and, and uh, you know, even in my will. Pastor Joe smiles when I say this, but it's true, in my will, I've made provision for the church. More than a tithe. Why not? I tithe my whole life. I'm also tithe them to death, right? I mean, the Salvation Army, they, they advertise for it on TV. Imagine if City Impact Church advertised on TV. Send us your money when you die. Hallelujah. <laughs> Me and Brian Tamaki then would be in trouble. <laughs> but it's true. And so the sacrifice of faith, and it's pretty simple. Number five, Sarah. Sarah was mentioned, as mentioned, she was past the point of childbearing. And she even laughed. Ever laughed at God? Ever laughed at a promise you received? She laughed when God suggested she'd have a child. And yet it says in Hebrews 11, verse 11, by faith Sarah herself also received strength. Everybody say strength. Strength to conceive seed. She was, when born a child, she was past the age because she judged him who was faithful, who had promised. So Sarah illustrates the strength of faith, the strength of faith. The strength, she overcame her doubts. She overcame her concerns through believing in a faithful God. God is not a man that he should lie. When he gives you a promise, hold on to it. God will strengthen you through the trials and the tribulations and she receives strength. Isaac, Isaac, Isaac is mentioned here in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 says, by faith, Isaac. Now, I've mentioned the story in Genesis 22, and I won't go into it, but not only was it a test for Abraham, it was a test for Isaac. He's walking along with his father. He's a teenage boy. They say round about 17, and he looks at the fire, you know, carrying a fire, and he looks at the, at the wood, and he says, Dad, I see the fire and the wood, but where's the sacrifice? <laughs> and Abraham says, God will provide my son. And you know, they went up on on Mount Moriah and he gets tied to the altar. Now listen, he could have run off. I would have run. You would have run. (laughs) Hello? I mean, Abraham was old, 100 years old. He wasn't going to catch a teenager. Come on. Isaac submitted to his father. Isaac submitted to his father the authority of his life and therefore, of course, ultimately submitted to God, his heavenly father. So Isaac illustrates the submission of faith. Are you writing this down? Submission of faith. I mean, who's speaking into your life? That great series on discipleship. Number seven, Jacob. Jacob. Hands up those who know Jacob's in their life. No? Jacob was a bit of a schemer. I can, I had a, I had a lot of that on me, particularly when I was younger. Look at me like that. Some of you are dirty, wrong sinners too. Scheme your way out of things, scheme your way into things. Anybody else here but a Jake? A couple of people. Some honest guys down here, all the rest are liars. And, but here's a man of highs and lows, ups and downs. See, you can't live your life on emotion. It's like a roller coaster, right? And a lot of people live their life on emotion. It's a poor, poor octane. 
ups and downs. I know a lot of people who live their life up and down. They're up one day and down the next. I know people who go, praise the Lord, brother, hallelujah. Next thing is, I won't say, I won't even say the letter. Um, it, start, it starts with F, you know. And, and this and that and this and that and that. You know, they're just like, you know, next minute, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And then there's, you know, up, up one day and down the next. Anybody like that? Don't put up your hands. But it's like from victory to defeat. It's like triumph to tragedy. And if you read Jacob's life, it was one of learning and growing, learning and growing, or growing and learning. And so Jacob illustrates the school of faith, the school of faith. So you've got to be in the school of faith. That's why being in church is so important. People say, well, I don't remember last week's message, nor do I. But it fed me last week, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't remember what my wife cooked me last week. In fact, she didn't cook me. We've been having takeaways for the last two weeks. Although last night we went to Pastor Claire's for, she cooked me a birthday dinner, which was awesome. It was the best meal I've had a long time. (laughs) I ate so much, I was so stuffed, I didn't have room for the birthday cake. But learning and growing, you've got to be, you've got to be in a place that's why gateways so important and other courses that you've got to grow and learn. Number eight, Joseph, I've got to move through. You doing okay out there? Out there in Botany, hallelujah, glory to God. Joseph, Pastor Rob Michelle, you're doing an awesome job out there. Love you guys. I hope your technology's working this morning. I know you've had a couple of hiccups lately and Nick and Holly out the West. God bless you guys. Bill Cluther is pumping, Joe, isn't it? Pumping. I've got to get down there. I've got to get down there and have a look for myself. You gotta sometimes see things for yourself. Not that I don't believe it. Joseph prospered wherever God put him. Joseph, number eight. In every place, the last one in the book of Genesis, in every place, Joseph found himself on the page of Scripture. And he goes from chapter 37 to chapter 50. We find Joseph prospering. We find Joseph being blessed. You know the story where there's in the pit or whether he's in Potiphar's house, whether he's in the prison, or, and some of you have been there, whether he's in the prison, or some of you in the palace. But he had faith to say this, you intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. Whoa, come on now. I would not want to go through what Joseph went through. Let's be honest. And yet to come through with an attitude like that, And in all of his journey, Joseph trusted God, even in his death. And that's why I talked about my will before. But Hebrews 11, 22, look at it. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure. Some of you need to write a new will after this. City Impact Church is the name. Pastor John McCall wants you to do that. (laughs) It won't benefit me, but... Uh, benefit the body, the church. Oh, I'm being serious about it. I mean, hey. By faith, Joseph, when he's dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions. <laughs> Man, pity a lot of people away this morning. They probably need to hear just that one point. Gave instructions concerning his bones. So what does Joseph illustrate to us? Starting with this. Joseph, this is so important. Joseph illustrated the success of faith. The success of faith. The success of faith. Hallelujah. If you're prepared to take steps of faith in your life, like Joseph, you will ultimately enjoy the success of faith. I look at my marriage. I look at my wife. I look at what I'm doing. I look, I, I, I'm, enjoying, I'm enjoying the success of faith. I could have lived a little life coming from a little town, a kid who couldn't speak till the age of seven, dad dying when he was 12. I could have lived a little life like some people I know, but I chose a different path. And if you're prepared to take the steps of faith, you will have the success of faith. Hallelujah. Say, I have faith. The simplicity of faith, you've got enough faith right now to start stepping out. Whether it's getting saved this morning, whether it's taking a step, I won't say going and buying a house, that can happen. I, when I was selling housing, I, this is true. I mean, some of you will know, 
I'm not boasting. I'm boasting in the Lord because that said, I dropped out of school at 15 and so forth. And God took me to New Zealand's top new housing salesman in New Zealand for seven years running. And so I sold 13 houses in one week once. That's pretty good, right? Eight in one day. That's true. I mean, this was like, you know, uh, we were selling land and house packages. But I had young couples, universal homes, busy homes. I had young couples say to me, oh, what happens if I break my leg and I can't afford to pay? And I'd say to them, and I was only a young guy, I'd say to them, I played rugby, I played rugby league, I ski, you know, and I've done all these things. I've jumped out of airplanes. I've never broken my leg. Why would you build your life on something like that? You know? And, you know, some people, they didn't buy because of fear. And then other people didn't. The ones who did, of course, those homes, which were only 25500 by the way, in Browns Bay, are now worth a million dollars. Some of you own some of them. Araruka Road, for example, right? I'm serious. So the ones who took the risk, hello? And so the thing is that some of you may need to put pen to paper. Man, I should be a real estate agent today. So, so, some of you... <laughs> Some of you, you know, just may, may need to ask that girl out. Get engaged like somebody down there I saw. And, and you know, you've got to take steps, right? The simplicity of faith, the stability of faith, the significance of faith, the sacrifice of faith, the strength of faith, the submission of faith, the school of faith, the success of faith. There's two more that I'm going to close on because we finished with the book of Genesis. We're moving now that the book of Hebrews mentions specifically these 10 people. 10 is interesting because it's a number of testing, right? And as I said, you'll get tested when you step out of faith. No two ways about it. But the thing is, is that there is 10 actually mentioned by name. So we come out of the book of Genesis into the book of Exodus by faith Moses and by faith Rahab. Now Moses, I'm moving from S to P only because it works. Moses illustrated the patience of faith. Everybody say the patience of faith. You know and I know that it's through faith and patience we inherit the promises. Oh, I love faith. Hallelujah. Hebrews 11, 24, by faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. My wife quoted this as she walked out of the bathroom to me this morning, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the best. She's listening to her uh, online Bible, choosing rather to afflict. She said, I never saw this particular point before. Suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king for he endured as seeing him who is invisible wow it's through faith and patience we inherit the promises she is making the point that he identified with Christ now patience means delay we're not good at it I know <laughs> well, well, is, there any, is there any people here who are just naturally pa- I'm sure there are naturally patient you don't mind waiting like you'll sit at a bus I'm one of those people who Flush the toilet before I'm finished, you know? I mean, I mean, yeah. don't look at me like that. We all go to the bathroom. But the thing is, is that, you know, I'm not good at waiting. You know, if there's a line, Bev is so patient in that. She'll just wait. There'll be others, you know, when you get into it, you know, like, like, like maybe Mr. Whippy or whatever. And people are rather than line, they're just all crowding in. And so people stand back and there'll be others who come and join that bunch and they'll be moving ahead of her. I says, Bev, move forward, girl, move forward. <laughs> who's, who's like me? Who's like Bev? You're the only person here, babe. <laughs> wow. Oh, another one over here. I mean, she'll let people go before, well, but she's been waiting for half an hour. Now, I'm all for letting people go ahead of me, but not if I've been waiting half an hour. No, 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 no. It's my turn. Just because you're 90 and fail, get out of my way. I mean, waiting. You know when that computer thing starts twirling? Oh, God have mercy. I can remember, you know, when we used to have to dial on party lines to get a phone call, you know, and and all now. Now I can't even, 
I can't even get signal in Coatesville. Coatesville can't get signal. So frustrating. Talking to people and it cuts out. It's like crazy. What am I, living in a third world or something? Probably. But in any case. <laughs> Faith and patience. Patience is delay, enduring, but it's enduring, listen now, without complaint. Don't you laugh at me, Pastor Joe. I don't laugh at you when you preach. Hey? It can even mean pain. Do you know that word patience is related to pain? Persevering. See, Moses asked something. Now listen to me. And I'm, 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 I wish everybody's here to hear it, but you may be watching online. Don't go to sleep now. This is an important point. Moses asked something that everybody on the planet has asked at some point of time in their life. Do you know what that question is? Why? Why, Lord? Why have you done this to me? Why haven't you done this for me? Why? Why, Lord? Do you know Moses prayed in Exodus 5.22, why, Lord? He asked why more than anybody else in history. Why, Lord, have you brought trouble on these people? Why have you sent me? Joshua cried out, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought these people over the Jordan to destroy us? Gideon cried out, Why then has all this happened to us? Nehemiah asked, Why is the house of the Lord forsaken? Job cried out, Why did I not die at birth? Have you ever had a bad day? The psalmist wrote, Why do you stand afar off, Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? David prayed, Why are you so far from helping me? As for prayed, oh Lord, why have you cast us off forever? Isaiah, are you starting to feel like you're in good company? Yeah. Isaiah asked, oh Lord, why have you made us stray from your ways? Jeremiah mourned, why have you stricken us so there's no healing for us? Now, if you don't think that's good company, Jesus himself on the cross cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I've heard preachers say you should not ask the why. Well, all these people ask the Why? Now, you may not get the answer you want. Rebecca, in Genesis 25, God promised her a baby. She's about to have a baby, and she said, if all is well, Lord, why am I like this? And he said, two nations, and and she died. And Graham, Billy Graham's daughter, said, if we don't figure out, listen now, and process the whys of life, we will end up very cynical, resulting in disastrous loss of faith. Did you just hear what I said? If we don't answer correctly, we'll become bitter instead of better. We all have had whys. I try not to ask them because I know some things will only be answered in glory. In Christ, listen now, are all (laughs) the hidden mysteries of the word, wisdom and knowledge. Do you know there's not one sparrow? Do you believe this? There's not one sparrow that falls to the ground without God knowing. The nations are about a drop in the bucket. He calculates the dust of the earth. He numbers the stars and he names them. Billions of them. Not one hair on your head falls out without him counting it. Do you believe that this morning? I said, do you believe that this morning? See, if you believe that this morning, you know that God is large and in charge and the wise don't seem to matter as much. I know things happen that we don't understand, but there's not a problem arises without him knowing it. When you don't understand something, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. See, listen now. When we trust in God, peace comes. He will give you a perfect peace which passes all human understanding. Now, you may not have been through something, but I know many of you have, and some of you are going through things now. Maybe it's relatives that are going through things, or maybe it's something that's happening to to somebody somewhere. But when you trust, peace comes. Joy comes. Joy, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we can be reassured that on one day, in a twinkling of an eye, we shall be like him. These heroes of faith, see, Moses had more wise than anybody. He had 40 years, 40 years, 40 years, you know, his life. 
And yet Moses illustrated the patience of faith. I close with Rahab. Rahab was a harlot, a prostitute. There's hope for everybody. And I'm not being belittling anybody, I'm just saying. A lot of people think Christians are squeaky clean. The trouble is some Christians, they think they're squeaky clean because of their own righteousness. We're only all squeaky clean because of Jesus, right? We all got to remember where we come from, all sinners, every one of us in the same boat. I said the other day, and it's so true that sometimes some Christians stand on the planet looking at people down in the pit, thinking, I'm glad I'm not like them. I'm I'm closer to God than them. But friend, (laughs) heaven, where God is, even though he lives within, I get that, but you know, nobody can reach it in their own strength, whether you're in the pit or whether you're on the earth, right? You never look down on people. Rahab illustrated what? Remember the peas? Patience of faith? You still with me or should I close now? You got one more minute? We could just go straight to the matinee. I could do one that, I'd like to do that ribbon thing. <laughs> Joe said he wouldn't look very good in leotards. Well, I certainly wouldn't. <laughs> but in any case, no, forget it, move on. Rahab, what'd you say, Christy, you cheeky thing? Bring a crowd. <laughs> Not sure about that, Chris. Rahab illustrated the peace of faith. Everybody say the peace of faith. See, peace Peace, if you look at it in the dictionary, it says an absence <laughs> and freedom from war and strife. But it's not true. Peace. Many people are at war in themselves through worry, through anxiety, through unbelief, through fear, through doubt, concerns. There's no peace in their heart. Peace. It's not just an absence of war. I get that. But it's being free on the inside, knowing your sins are forgiven, knowing that you're going to heaven when you leave this planet. Hebrews 11 verse 31, by faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish with those who did not believe when she received the spies with peace. Everybody say, the peace of faith. So church, please, this morning, campuses, please, this morning. I know we're heading into Christmas, but let's remember the simplicity of faith, the stability of faith, the significance of faith, the sacrifice of faith, the strength of faith, the submission of faith, the school of faith, and the success of faith. And from Exodus, the patience and the peace of faith. Say, I have faith. So pursue faith, persevere in faith, prevail in faith, persist in faith, and proceed in faith. In other words, walk it out, church. Walk it out. Young people, walk it out. Every day counts as you take steps of obedience. You know, it's so true that just a few minutes <laughs> messing up in life can cause so much heartache and so much agony, right? Be consistent. If you're prepared to take steps of faith like Joseph, you'll ultimately enjoy the success of faith. So let's not murmur, let's not complain. Let's not think, well, Lord, why have you brought me out this far? Not to take me back again, but let's pursue by having a, I'll give you a couple more, by having a passion of faith, a posture of faith, a pure faith, not a divided mind, a professing faith to boldly and loudly declare, I believe, therefore I speak. I speak in Jesus' name. I believe, therefore I spoke. So remember, faith is positive and create a permanency of faith in your life. We're all on a faith journey. And by staying in faith, we will succeed.